There you go. All right. Uh, welcome, guys, to another workshop session. This is one of the um, open source series uh, that we started. The last workshop session was talking about the introduction to open source contributions, where we looked at contributing to Web3 projects via open source. And uh, we have Ikene Eze here once again, a developer advocate at at Shadium to come and take us in the next part in the series, which is going to be focusing on contributing to layer one chains. And I really hope that you get value from this as much as we got from the first session. So on that note, without further ado, I will bring in um, Ikena Eze on stage. Uh, thanks so much. Please, you have the stage. All right. Thank you very much, Joshua, for that introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, can you enable that uh, host disabled attendee screen sharing? Oh, please, just a second. Sure. Please try to share now. Okay. Yes, I see that I can share my screen. Right. Uh, let me know when you can see it. There. I can see it now. Awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me again. This is the second time that I'm coming to uh, have the workshop with Web3 Africa. The first time was really lovely. I really enjoyed it. And I think we, uh, we did a couple of amazing things. Uh, this is my second time. And today I'll be talking about contributing to layer one chains. So let's dive right into it. Why should you do it in the first place? So that's usually the question that I hear uh, uh, very often. It's like every time I'm talking to people about you know, open source contributions uh, and it's, it's tasking, yeah? Um, but one of the questions is usually why? Why should I do that? Um, one of the reasons is it helps you with learning. Uh, you get to gain deep knowledge of blockchain technology consensus mechanisms, smart contracts, you get to collaborate with people. Um, those are some of the learnings that you wouldn't, you know, just no really other way to gain that, those uh, kind of experiences and learn from people who are building the things that you're working on uh, as, uh, as opposed to, you know, maybe just learning on your own and you know, Googling stuff and going on YouTube. Uh, so this is a very good way to learn, uh, especially when you're interested in a particular niche like Web3, for instance. Uh, this would be a very good way for you to learn how uh, all these technologies work together. Another really important thing is the sense of community that comes around open source contributions you know when you collaborate with the engineers who are you know building the the for instance shadium uh, or building ethereum or building polygon or building you know whatever uh, else um blockchains that are out there if you build that with them and you have this sense of community that you all are working towards a certain goal even if you're not part of the company even if you're not being paid to do that, it kind of like just helps build your confidence in the things that you can do. Uh, and it's also built your reputation, right? From the community, people can know you as that engineer that contributes X, Y, Z thing to this tool, to this framework, to this chain. Uh, and yeah, that's a very good thing that will ultimately help your career, uh, which is the next thing on my list is it opens doors to Web3 job opportunities and it will enhance your portfolio. So when you're uh, when it's ready, when you're ready and you want to start looking for jobs or you want to uh, get a full-time role, um, your open source contributions can become your portfolio. You know, that could be something that you talk uh, to recruiters with like, hey, I've contributed to layer one chains, I've contributed to rollups, I've contributed to Ethers.js, Web3.js, you know, all of these things can be things that you can point back to uh, when it's time for you to get a job. Oh, and then there's also the general impact of helping shape the fundamental infrastructure of uh, dApps and the future of Web3. Um, if you contribute to L1 chains, that's that's the building block of the you know Web3 ecosystem. Uh, and that will be something that, like when they tell the story of Web3, uh, the way we know about the people who are, who are the founders of Web3 or the people who kind of started the movement, It'd be interesting if your name was part of them, right? Uh, and that could be, this could be your, you know, your gateway to being part of uh, the story of how our blockchain technology came into being. All right, what are layer one chains? Um, 
Yeah, that's why that's actually why I put the layer one change in the title of the workshop because I wanted to draw a bit more emphasis into it. Uh, the last time I was talking about open source contribution in general, in general, uh, but this time I wanted to you know, let's look at layer one change a bit more so that if you don't understand what it is, maybe this session would be a good way for you to really know what it is uh, and maybe also know what you know um, layer two chains are. But let's see how it goes. Um, so. Layer one chains are the base blockchains that provide infrastructure upon which all other decentralized applications are built, right? They, they handle core functionalities like security, transaction processing, um, you know, consensus mechanisms and all that. They have three key features. Um, decentralization is one of them. It ensures that there's no single point of failure or point of ownership uh, across the entire network. Uh, consensus mechanisms, uh, where they basically provide the infrastructure that the validators in the network use to determine uh, if transactions are valid or not. Uh, and then security, you know, they have very robust uh, cryptographic protocols that ensure that the data in the network uh, are legit and they are immutable. And then some of the Maybe popular names that you would know uh, in the in the layer one uh, layer ones are Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, I think Solana, Tezos as well. A couple of them are layer one blockchains that basically lay the foundation, and then uh, a, a ton of other people build on top of these layer ones to basically enhance and improve the processes. And as I will show you as we progress. However, uh, layer ones face a couple of challenges, right? As can be expected, the transaction speed is not so fast, right? And the reason why there's like a limited number of transactions that can be processed per second uh, is because of the, let's say the block size and the block time is really high on uh, layer ones. For instance, Bitcoin processes about seven transactions per second which is not so big. Uh, Ethereum is about 30, 15 to 30 transactions uh, per second um, when you're using like the proof of work uh, consensus mechanism. So it's not very big. There's a little bit of lag uh, in terms of how fast they can process transactions. Uh, there's also the issue of network congestion. Like the higher people use the network, like uh, I think sometimes when you try to perform some transactions on blockchain, you, you see that, that this is peak period. So things might take longer, gas fees are much higher, things like that would happen because there's a bit of congestion in the network. All the transactions are being queued and they are processed one after the other. And that could uh, you know, not give you the user a very good experience. And then it's also resource intensive, right? Uh, the capacity of the machines that would run the validators for these networks, they have to be like really high uh, CPU, GPU requirements. So um, that issue kind of like brought us into where we call the, like the blockchain trilemma, where um, decentralization of course ensures that there's no single uh, source of failure. Security is good because we want to protect the network against that uh, from people who would like to attack the network and uh, you know mess with the integrity of the data. And then scalability because we want to be able to handle as much transactions as possible. However, it becomes kind of difficult to do one uh, to to get all three done, right? Uh, and I have a I have a good example that I'd like to share. Uh, just hold on, give me one second. Um, the story of um, Bitcoin, I th I think, right? Um, the it it's very Bitcoin is not very scalable, right? But it's very secure, right? It, if if you um, if you want to, for instance, make Bitcoin more scalable, then you risk uh, making it less decentralized. Right, because let's say you in, in, increase the increase the block size, uh, it will it will be a little bit faster, but then it requires less validators in the network, and that would sacrifice decentralization. So there's a couple of stories like this where, in order to you know improve decentralization, you would sacrifice security, or in order to improve scalability, you would sacrifice decentralization or security to some extent. So just these issues that. Um, uh, we haven't quite figured out in the layer one space, which is why we have layer twos, right? Uh, layer twos 
follow a couple of different approaches to achieve what they do. One of them is state channels. Uh, these are off-chain transactions that only interact with the main chain for final settlement. So they mostly do their work off-chain and then come to the main chain to basically get finality on, on their processes. Uh, then there's also side chains. These are also chains that are running in parallel with the main chain. Uh, they have their own consensus mechanisms, so they don't completely rely on layer ones for um, maybe you know coming to consensus on any transaction. And then there are rollups, right? These ones are a bit more widely known, uh, but basically they bundle transactions into one single transaction and bring it to the main chain for to be processed. There's optimistic and ZK rollups. You can look them up uh, later on. But these are some of the approaches that layer two solutions mostly adopt to basically improve what is available on, on layer ones. Then the results of those um, improvements that layer twos have done is that there's increased throughput, right? They can process more transactions per second by handling them off chain. Uh, there's reduced fees again, because uh, lower transaction cost by minimizing the, the load on the main chain and the experience is better. So for instance, you don't have to wait for, maybe you want to send, you want to send a token from one wallet to another wallet and you don't have to wait for an hour for that to happen. Uh, so these are significant results uh, as opposed to what we had before with layer ones. Then um, a real world example of how this works is for instance, let's consider uh, Ethereum as a layer one. It, the issue is it has like very high gas fees and there's network congestion. And then a layer two solution like Optimism, for instance, employs the uh, roll-up approach, <coughs> employs the roll-up approach to significantly improve the experience of using a layer one that is Ethereum. So with that, you get, you know, lower gas fees, faster network, no network congestion, a ton of that. Um, yeah, and that is the impact of having uh, all these networks be built on the layer ones. Um, but yeah, I wanted to give this context so that when we talk about layer ones, it's, it's understandable and you can at least theoretically uh, have a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, so let's bring it back to open source and Web3, right? The open source, the, most of the projects that we've talked about so far, you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, Polygon, a ton of other technologies we've mentioned so far are in fact uh, open source, right? So Web3 uh, really, really does agree with the open source uh, ethos of being transparent, working, uh, be, being able to work with other people in the industry, collaborating with other existing communities, uh, being community driven as well. Um, those are some of the things that I've seen in at least the, the Web3 communities that I've been a part of that I've, or that I've kind of like kept my eyes on. Um, code is publicly available for review, modification and improvement. That's the whole point of, um, that's the whole thing that we preach in open source is uh, all of these technologies we've mentioned or that we've said are open source. You can go on GitHub or you know wherever they are, they are hosting their code base. You can look at their code, you can make modifications, you can suggest improvements, uh, which means that it's, post it's available for everyone in the community to basically have a say on. How does this benefit you as a developer? At the start, I talked about why you should do open source, right? You get to learn, you get to con collaborate with people. It's the same thing, right? Once you start doing it, you, you see that you start learning about a project directly from the maintainers or from the people who are building it. Uh, it helps you build your portfolio once again. So it basically makes it easy for you to get hired. Uh, so if, if a recruiter is trying to interview someone and they're like, hey, what, what, what's your experience working in Web3? What have you done in the past? You know, give us, tell us a bit about your journey. If you say that you've contributed to Polygon and you've contributed to Shadium and you've contributed to Mina protocol or Near protocol, uh, they, they will be a little bit more interested in hiring you, right? As opposed to, hey, I'm just learning. I'm trying to figure things out. Um, uh, that doesn't speak uh, confidence on your part. And then there's the um, ability to collaborate with like-minded people, you know, build your reputation, let people know you, see what you can do so that they can speak for you uh, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, that's also very good. Uh, that's a very good value that comes out of being active in the open source community. Then how do you get started? 
Um, this is a very popular question as well. Uh, so I would say find your passion first. Um, find where, just go where your interest takes you. And the way that you can get to the point where your interest will take you is to start from somewhere, right? So join communities, join open source communities. If you don't know any, you know, ask me after this call. I'm going to recommend a few towards the end. But you can Google them. You can check on Twitter uh, what are open source communities you could join. You could join uh, anyone that interests you or as many as you can, basically, so that you can look at what you are doing, see what picks your interest. Um, and then you can choose uh, the project that aligns with your interest and your skill set. Uh, you'd be interested at how many projects are open source these days. There's almost every project is open source. Uh, so it's just about looking at them, finding out which one is interesting to you and which one you feel you have uh, skills, enough skills to, to be able to contribute to. And then read and understand the project's code base, the architecture, the documentation. Yes, once again, that's what is required of you to do to be able to say, hey, I like this project. If you haven't read and you haven't quite understood what you're trying to do, then you can possibly, you know, decide, make the decision of I like them or I don't like them. Um, and then when you've done that, the best thing to do is to start small. Uh, look for good first issues uh, in the previous workshop we talked about finding good um finding uh good first issues and you know uh kick it, knocking them off um fix some bugs uh, everything is not every open source contribution is not like a, like a very big uh code contribution it could be a an issue you identified as you're reading the docs it could be an issue you identified as you're trying to npm install some of the packages they use you know whatever you just try to get your hands dirty and see where the thing takes you um Testing as well could be a good way. Uh, that's actually something that I I'm doing a lot of these days. So that would be that could be somewhere that you know your interest lies. So consider testing as well as a way of you know contributing to open source. Uh, and then the one that doesn't get talked about enough is the people that help in community management, answering questions in forums, helping people find resources. All of these, I think we started a program where we uh, are charging, where we now find a way to recognize people who are doing that and actually offer them the benefits that comes with being a core contributor to the Shadium network. Uh, because we, we, and not just us, but I think a lot of people also recognize the benefits of having people who are active in your community and who are helping you, you know, keep the wheels turning. Um, so if that is something that you like to do, you could find one of these communities and, you know, offer to, to, help them do that. Uh, some of the projects that I wanted to basically uh, recommend, or were well, not really recommend, but to give you something to start, so you can start looking at. Um, I like when things are actionable. Uh, so if anything I'm saying here interests you and you'd like to just start clicking a few buttons, these are a few of the open source um, uh, projects that you can start looking into. I, I've got Bitcoin, I've got Shadium, I've got Ethereum, Solana, a couple of them. Just put in the links on the slide so that when you get the slide deck, you can click them and check them out. You know, join the communities. Some of them are on Discord, some are on Telegram, uh, a couple of different places. And, you know, see which one you like most. Uh, you, you could end up liking a couple of them, which is also fine. It just basically means you're uh, broadening up your network. And then uh, do not limit yourself to layer ones. Uh, I think I did mention that you could also contribute to like frameworks like Web3, JS, Ethers, JS, uh, where is the platform where they, you can you know, build your smart contracts and deploy them. A couple of different uh, um, projects that are open source that you should be able to you know, find a way to contribute to. Uh, I titled the workshop uh, layer ones but I also don't want you to limit yourself to layer ones. Sometimes the barrier to entry into contributing to layer ones could be high, um, but it doesn't, that shouldn't dissuade you from um, contributing to Web3 projects in general or Web2 or really you know, any other open source project where your interest lies. Um, the way you can find other projects, like uh, the, if you look at all the links I, I showed in the previous slide and you don't really like them, you could go on, on GitHub and try to do the repository search thing, search repositories that are tagged Web3, blockchain. Uh, if you're into AI, you can check repositories that are tagged AI, things like that, to basically um, refine your search a little bit. Uh, 
Uh, another way is to participate in hackathons, right? It's a very good way to find projects that you may not know will excite you until you start working on it. Um, so hackathons are very popular in Web3. A lot of people do them uh, mostly to get the money at the end of the day, right? That let's, let's be honest. Usually when you're doing a hackathon, you want to win and get the prize fund. Um, but it also offers a very good opportunity to you know, learn what the project is about, work with people to achieve a certain goal. You feel good about yourself at the end of the day when you've achieved what you wanted to achieve. So how do you contribute? You know, let's say that I've, I've, you are sold on all of these things that I'm saying and you'd like to start contributing today. Uh, again, I would refer you to the previous workshop. We did a hands-on approach of contributing to a project, right? So we did all this, uh, fork the repository, create a branch, make your changes, submit a pull request, collaborate with the maintainers until you get it to look how they want it. Um, but I wanted to put this uh, on screen as well today because sometimes it can all sound very abstract and you're, you know, somebody is just saying all these things, but you really don't know, have the steps. So I would, if you do find the project you'd like to contribute to, again, fork the repository. If any of this sounds weird to you, you can quickly Google them. Um, you know what is fork fork a repository, and then you would you, you would get a uh, a good explainer, or simply watch the the video recording from the last workshop and see how we did all that. Uh, so when you do that, you can create a new branch. You can make your changes in your new branch. You can su submit a pull request with your changes, basically saying, "Hey, these are the things that I've done in the in the repository," and the maintainers they will review the things that you've done and say, "Hey, okay, we like it, and we merge it," or "Hey, we want you to do it a little bit different." Uh, and that way, they give you feedback, and you work together with them to get to the point where you want th that you want it to be. And then uh, I have a couple of tips for you uh, if you'd like to get started. Uh, with contributing to layer bonds. The, one of them is be patient. Um, open source contributions do take time and effort. Um, so don't rush yourself. Don't try to like knock it off today and say, hey, I want to contribute. So let me just quickly do something right now and say that I've contributed. Uh, be patient with yourself. Sometimes even finding the right project you want to contribute to can take weeks. Uh, so don't, don't, uh, basically time box yourself, allow yourself the time to find what you're interested in, the thing that will excite you, and then go do it. Another one is you should ask a lot of questions. You, you cannot possibly know a new project as much as the people who've been maintaining and building it. Um, so don't hesitate to ask questions. What is this? What can I do? You can actually just go there and say, what can I do? And they will let you know uh, where they need help. Or they can at least point you to like a, their good first issues and you can look through it and see what you what you can work with. Uh, and when you do find something that you'd like to contribute to, chances are you wouldn't still have all the information to be able to do it yourself. So you can say, ask questions uh, about how, how do you want this to be? And then they can explain to you. So it's also basically improves your ability to work with other people. Communicating clearly is also basically not just about writing clear commit messages and, you know, pull request descriptions, but also the people, the maintainers that, you know, you walk and go back and forth with, be able to communicate clearly what you're doing, what you've done, what you've struggled with, the approaches you've taken, all of these things uh, helps improve your collaboration skills. And then uh, almost every of these open source projects will have a contributing guide on, on their repository that basically walks you through the process of how you can contribute to that project. So feel free to learn that, uh, follow their best practices, follow their documented approaches uh, so that you have less back and forth and less review cycles when you do make your PR. And how you can get started right away. So if all of this sounds good to you and you want to take the first step, I would recommend joining the Shadium open source community. That is where I work, uh, disclaimer. Um, what we do is basically mentor contributors, especially early stage contributors who are trying to get their foot into the Web3 space. Um, we have weekly calls where we show you how to make PRs, how you can contribute, the skills you need, how to teach you all of these things so that you can then go off and make your own contributions 
not necessarily on Shadium. If you make contributions on Shadium Perfect, we we have a, lo a lot of um, things that we give to you back in return. But the goal of our mentorship sessions is not to get you to contribute to Shadium. It's to help you to learn some open source values so that you can go and start contributing to open source. Uh, we have weekly building public streams uh, for the contributors uh, that we have in our community where we do a couple of things. Uh, we teach about open source there. We build in public there. Uh, we've been building the Shadium Network monitoring page uh, for some time now. I think we've completed it at this point. But if you like to like watch engineers, you know, walk through problems and build and try to build uh, a product on stream, that would be a, that is something we do very often uh, that you can also benefit from there. Then for the people who are actively contributing to, to the Shadium code base, uh, we give things like LinkedIn badges to them, like, hey, uh, this is to basically give you reputation and say, hey, this person has indeed contributed to Shadium. So if a recruiter is doubting your qualifications or trying to figure out, oh, you said you contributed to this place, but like, how, how do I know that you did that? You know, that badge will be on your LinkedIn profile and they will see that it was issued from, from us. Uh, so that would kind of like improve your chances with them. We have exclusive permissions as well that give you rights to um, exclusive resources and channels where you can talk directly with your engineers uh, and we can all, you know, build Shadium together. And then we started doing, uh, we're going to start doing uh, uh, next month a contributor spotlight where we have like a fancy social media banner with your face and your name and you know the contributions that you've made on it and we share it around um generally we are trying to help get engineers employed um so all the things that we're doing all the things that we are offering to contributors is in ways to help make sure that if you're an indie dev and you're trying to get started in web3 contributing to shadium would be a very good path for you to get employed uh, so that's what I've got for you this week. Um, I have a video that I'm going to maybe share with your, uh, with the organizers of the community later on, where we go on, pick out an issue on a JSON RPC server, solve that issue, send the PR back to the maintainers and have them review it and let us know if there's any, any issue or they will merge it. I think that will also be very appropriate for this audience, seeing that this is a workshop about contributing to layer one chains. Um, so that is going to be the actual contribution to the layer one chain. I'm going to record that video. It will be on my YouTube channel, but I will share it with the uh, community as well so that anyone who'd like to benefit from that will get access to it. Uh, if you'd like to ask me any questions in the future or you'd like to get in touch and be part of my network, I'm on Twitter at Kenny underscore IO. You can email me at the email on screen and that is my website. So thank you all very much. And I hope this has been helpful. I will look forward to coming again next time. Thank you, everyone. I think there, there are thank a couple of questions. Thank you so much, uh, Kenny. I think there's a question in the chat. <laughs> OK. Okay, is there anyone that has any question before our speaker leaves? Okay, so the question here is saying about the slides, which I think you said you're going to send it to, uh -huh. send it over. Yeah, so that's a set of, all right, so last call, if you have any questions around this, it's, this is the right time to say something. Yeah. And if, if anyone would like to ask a question subsequently, yeah. that's also fine. I don't like putting people on the spot, especially on community calls like this. Some people are not very comfortable, you know, raising up their hands and stuff. So if they have questions later or in the future, you can send that to me and I will I will get to it. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Kenny. Uh okay, so someone is raising up his hand. Coxie, please just unmute your mic and say something. Sure. Hi. Good evening. Hello. Sorry. This, how can I join the Shadow community? You said something about joining the community and contributing. Yes. Um, let me 
Let me grab a link and put in the chat since you have access to the link to the chat. Let's uh, invite people. All right, so I'm going to put a link to the Shadim Discord in the chat. When you do join, uh, maybe I should just share my screen again and show you where we are. Uh, Joshua, I can't share my screen again. Um, but if you do join the, the Discord server, you can look for the OSS Devs channel. That's what it's called, OSS-Devs. That's the channel where the open source community lives. And that's probably where you will find all the you know answers to the questions you're looking for and, and where all our weekly events you happen. Can you can share now. Yeah? You can share, so you can screen. share screen. I can? OK. Yeah, so this is the one. Uh, if you can see my screen, this is the channel that I was talking about is the OSS devs. So this is where, uh, I mean, if you're looking at it, where also I, I, I just recently made a poll trying to find out what they would like us to stream about uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so this is where the OSS devs community lives. Um, and I don't know if it's public. Okay, yeah, it is public, I guess. Okay, I can see. All right, thank you. That's it. Uh, any other question? Okay, I see Bami as an answer. Uh, I'm thinking yeah. of a question as well. Hi, Bami. Um, How are you doing? I, I'm good. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask um, for your community, how can a community manager contribute to your community without uh, or with basic knowledge of Web3? Yeah, I don't. I I do think very small amount of Web three knowledge is required for community management. Um, but first, you have to know if the, like you have to DM the the moderators of the community and because I, sometimes they do need to give you access if you really want to become like a moderator. They need to give you the moderator access, um, which is usually really hard because they need to trust you. You have to go through some you know, meetings with them, basically for them to ascertain your authenticity. Uh, but that's not the kind of, you know, as open source contribution I was talking about. It's the, it's the type where you are part of a community, you are answering all the questions that come up, uh, you are helping people get access to the right resources, you're, uh, where you, you're keeping an eye on the, you know, issues or wherever people are asking questions channel and finding those answers and giving it to them even before the moderators get the time to do that. You know, in Shadium, for instance, we recently shipped a couple of swags to people in India who were just constantly helping with the community. You know, somebody would ask a question about OSS and before I wake up the next day to answer it, that person had already answered it. And, you know, that kind of makes my job easier and I wanted to reward those people. So that's what I, I suggest for people who'd like to start contributing to open source. Shadium is counting those kind of work as open source contribution because they are not paying you to do it. You know, you're just doing it out of your own free will. Uh, so when there's like tokens for contributors, that person would get those tokens. If there's any other benefit that applies to contributors, this, that person would also get it because they are actively helping. And I believe it, a lot of other communities are recognizing those efforts as well. So it might not only be Shadium, but wherever you join, just try to be visibly helpful to people and I'm sure that they will notice it. All right, yep. thank you very much. That helps. Thank you. All right. Uh, so is there any other question? I think we're having a roll here. Yeah. Let me check the chat one more time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think the coast is clear. Awesome. All right, on that note, thank you so much for coming around, guys. Uh, you know, action, test or take, um, join the Discord group. Uh, you know, try to start contribution to open source, look for projects you can contribute to, and just start putting to this stuff to action. And uh, Kenny said you can reach out to him on Twitter if you do have questions and also reach out to him on the Discord group for more, like if you have, if you need more insights on what was discussed today. Okay, so on that note, thank you so much for coming around. This has been the second, um, the second series of the workshop on open source. Uh, I hope to see you guys on the next one. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, thank guys. you everyone. Bye everyone.
Yeah.